So today we're going to be going over uh, some of the common tools that we use in medicine. So what we have here on the table is a variety of tools, two stethoscopes that I'll go through, the Queen Square reflex hammer, the Tomahawk reflex hammer, a 512 hertz tuning fork, a 128 hertz tuning fork, and a monofilament. Now there are other things you may use, but these are probably the most commonly used instruments in the physical exam. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to start with the stethoscope. A very common stethoscope we often use is the Lippmann Cardiology 3 stethoscope. One of the things that Lippmann has done to kind of really sell their stethoscope is developed what's called tunable technology. And this is very much aimed at the medical student level because it allows medical students to use the same stethoscope both in pediatrics as well as adult medicine and have the option of both using a diaphragm and a bell. <coughs> so this is a Lippmann stethoscope that has not been converted uh, to the available bell kit. So this is how it's usually sold with both sides as a diaphragm. The larger side for adult and the smaller side for pediatrics. Now the way the tunable technology works is that when you take the stethoscope and push on the surface hard, it acts like a diaphragm, and thus it's mainly the high frequency sounds you tend to hear. Whereas you just kind of let go lightly and just barely make a seal on the surface, it then acts in bell mode. And what that allows, it actually kind of removes some of that high frequency and more emphasizes the low frequencies and thus functions like a bell. You can do that on both sides of the stethoscope, pushing down hard for diaphragm, or just barely making a seal to act like a bell. Now, this is very convenient as a medical student as you're rotating between both adult and pediatric settings. Family medicine is an excellent example where patient one can be an adult, patient two can be a child. And so it works very well in that way. However, there is the option to convert it to a more traditional bell. And I'll show you that now. So this we have here, again, the adult side, which is the diaphragm. But instead of a pediatric side, this death scope has been converted to a bell. So in this case, you would still take the regular diaphragm side, push down a little hard so that it's a diaphragm, and if you wanted to, you can modulate the pressure and go lighter so that it acts like a bell. Okay? Or you can actually switch it over like you would with the traditional stethoscope, and again, you just have to make a very light seal for this to act like a bell. Now, one of the things you can do is if you're listening to something with a bell, and then you start to wonder, you know, is that, let's say, a split S2 versus an S3? Well, if it's an S3, you should hear it best with the light pressure. What you can then do is, with the bell side, push down harder, and actually stretching the skin actually acts like a diaphragm, and it'll actually attenuate the low frequency sound. So if you do that and push hard with the bell, and the sound gets softer, that does uh, reassure you that it was a low frequency sound. Versus if it got louder, then it makes you wonder, oh, maybe that's a split S2. So those are the two options you can use with the Littmann stethoscope. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to demonstrate the use of the stethoscope, how to hold it on a patient. So we have our patient here, uh, and so what we're going to do is use the stethoscope, and one of the key things is the earpieces are going to point forwards, okay, and then you're going to put them in your ears, obviously. And then one of the key things with holding it is some people find that if you have your finger sort of over here touching it, you can get a lot of noise. Generally, you do want to tap and make sure you're on the right side. So I'm going to flip that over so I can hear. So I'm on the diaphragm side. But even still, even though I'm not on the bell side, I can actually hear a lot of noise just putting my finger here. You do have to just try a variety of things to see what works best for you. What I find tends to help is if I just hold the stethoscope right here, I can still get a good grip. What some people like to do is put their fingers through like this, and that works as well. You may find that doing this works just fine, you don't get a lot of extra noise, but it all depends. So try a variety of things. So now we're going to actually examine this patient, showing you what we can do uh, with both modulating the pressure or flipping it over. So we're going to presume we've already done 
inspection and palpation. So moving on to auscultation, the four sort of cardinal areas. So I'm listening over the right upper sternal border, pushing down as you can see with diaphragm-like pressure. And I can hear S1 and S2 very nicely. Again, over the left upper sternal border. And the left lower sternal border. And then moving to the apex. And I ideally will go fifth intercostal midclavicular wherever I felt the apex. So first I'm going to start again with the diaphragm type pressure. And I can hear S1 and S2. And then what I'm going to get uh, the patient to do, could you please roll away from me a little bit? Okay. That's good, just like that. Good. 45 degrees. No, sorry, a little bit more. Perfect. Okay. And then there's two options. I can just keep listening. This is still diaphragm. And then push a little lighter. And then essentially, I'm using it like a bell. And I don't appreciate any low frequency sounds. Or I can turn over to the proper bell and just very lightly make a seal. And I don't hear any low frequency sounds. In a young healthy male, we could very well get an S3, which can be physiologic. Okay, great, you can roll back over, thank you. So that is essentially the key things about using the stethoscope. Again, to sort of recap, uh, Harder pressure, diaphragm, light pressure, bell, and when you hold it, be careful that if you're hearing a lot of noise in your ears while your fingers are on this side, even though it's this side is active, you may want to try things like holding it like this or putting your fingers like this. Just play around with it and see what works best. We're now going to move on to our next instrument. So next we're going to be covering the reflex hammers. So these are probably two of the most common reflex hammers, although there are other ones you may see. And th this one, the tomahawk, I'll be honest, gets a little bit of a bad rap. It's not as bad as you may hear. However, the key thing is you need to know how to swing it properly. This is, again, the queen square. It's a lot easier to use, especially if you're a novice, but we're going to demonstrate both of them. So I'm going to ask my patient, if you don't mind sitting up, please. So we'll start with the queen square. And what's really nice about this is the long handle that kind of allows gravity to help you out a lot. So although you are still swinging it, okay, the gra gravity will help uh, bring the head down. So what we're going to be doing is just doing the biceps reflex to sort of see the impact of it. So. I'm just letting it fall and hit the biceps. We can see the reflex very nicely, okay? As opposed to the tomahawk, if I were to do the same thing and just let it fall, there really isn't much of a reflex. And this is where it isn't as helpful. However, one of the key things is you don't want to be holding the tomahawk like a hammer. What you actually want to do is hold it this way, really between two fingers. You can have a third for stability. And what you want to do is kind of swing it like you're throwing a dart, okay? So you can kind of see that movement that is going through my fingers like this, okay? And that way you can get a bit more speed, a bit more power with this. If we do that, again, putting a finger on the tendon, this was, again, holding it like a hammer the wrong way, you really don't get much. Whereas if you hold it properly, and as you can see there, I'm getting a nice reflex, okay? So you really do need to practice that though, okay? And obviously be careful, don't let go. It can go flying across the room, but you do need to let it really swing, okay? So that's the tomahawk. Now, the correct answer with almost everything in medicine is get used to something and use it all the time. So there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, it is the better one in terms of getting reflexes, especially at a novice level. But my sort of statement always is, the best reflex hammer is the one that you can actually carry on you. We look at a typical lab coat, the tomahawk can fit right in there. Whereas I find with this one, what do I do with this? Okay, I've seen people string it through the buttonholes on their lab coat and that's okay. I don't know if it's a fashion statement, but it is a way to carry it. You can buy some of these that actually have a uh, retractable handle, and that makes sense. I actually did own one of those at one point, but it broke. And so I decided, well, 
this one really isn't going to break. And as long as you practice, it works just fine. You will notice that both of them have sort of a pointed end that's useful for the Babinski or plantar reflex. Again, what I want to emphasize is there is really no right or wrong. You just need to practice, practice, practice with these reflex hammers. So we're now going to move on to the next tool. So what we have here is we have two different tuning forks, and it's important the difference between the two, okay? So, for those of you who play piano, middle C, if I remember, is about 256 hertz. So the smaller tuning fork is actually one octave higher, 512 hertz, and the larger one is one octave lower at 128 hertz. They don't always actually hit middle C because I don't know if the rigor of creating them is quite what a musician was like, but they're fairly close and they meet the purposes uh, they respectively have. So we're going to start with the 512 hertz. And this is the tool you use when you're testing cranial nerve A, specifically the Weber and Renee's tests. So with this tuning fork, what you're going to do is you're going to strike it. And whenever you strike a tuning fork, what you will commonly see people do is take the tuning fork and hit their elbow. I don't know why they do that. That hurts, okay? I would honestly suggest hitting some other surface or if you have the reflex hammer, you can just hit it. And that rings very nicely, okay? Um, so what we're gonna do is Weber and Renee's test. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this test in the context of using this because it's kind of helpful to understand it. The purpose of Weber and Renee's is to figure out if a patient has problems with their hearing, i.e. they tell you I'm having ringing in my right ear or you know, I have troubles hearing people who are sitting to the right of me. You need to know which ear is the problem first before you do either of these. Then you're going to use this to distinguish between sensory neural hearing loss where the nerves aren't transmitting the noise or conductive hearing loss where due to recurrent infections or something else is going on uh, within the auditory system, there's actually a problem where, think of it as excessive debris blocking conduction, but in fact, there's more material to actually conduct sound through bone as opposed to through air. One of the key principles is normally, air will conduct better than bone. When you have sensory neural hearing loss, both of those are reduced. Okay? So you still get air conducting better than bone, but it's just reduced on that side. As opposed to in conductive hearing loss, if air is here and bone is here, you actually get decreased air conduction and increased bone conduction with that. So there's two tests you can do. Weber's test, or I believe it's German, so maybe it should be said Weber's test, is placing the tuning fork in the middle of the forehead and trying to see if it localizes to one side or the other. Okay? We're going to pretend that this patient has a problem with their left ear to sort of orient us to what is happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to strike the tuning fork and put it on the middle of his forehead. And I'm going to ask the patient which side he hears it. Okay? Now he's a normal patient, so he actually hears it in the midline. But let's pretend he says, hey doc, I actually hear it on my left side. And it makes you think, well that's odd. He said he has left ear problems. If he truly had sensory neural hearing loss where the nerves are just not conducting, he should have localized it to the right side, the normal. The fact that he localized it to the left side, the problem ear, suggests he actually has conductive hearing loss. There's just some sort of, think of it as extra debris or material that is actually increasing conduction on that side, okay? I actually find Weber's test is much easier to do because you just put it in one place and you're done. You just have to remember sensory neural will decrease it on that side, conductive will increase it. But then there is Rene's test. And in this test, what you're doing is you're actually testing both the bone conduction by placing it on the mastoid as well as air conduction outside the ear. And so the way you do this is again, you hit the tuning fork and what I'm going to do is place the tuning fork on the mastoid after I've struck it. And then I'm going to ask the patient to tell me when he no longer hears uh, the sound. So please let me know when you no longer hear it. Now. Can you still hear it? Yes. 
cap. And that is a normal finding in the Renee's test. Now what you have to realize is you can get that quote unquote normal finding on an ear that subjectively has problems. And what that suggests is a sensory neural problem, meaning the relative air conduction bone conduction is still preserved, but everything is decreased. If he had conductive hearing loss on this side, as our previous example of the Weber's, what would actually happen is, I would have him listen, and when he says it stops, I would take it off and put it by his ear, and he would say, no, I can't hear it, because it's transmitted, transmitted better through the bone, okay? So that is Weber and Renee's. Again, you don't have to do Renee's on both sides, because really what you're trying to do is take a problem ear, and then look to see if it's sensory neural versus conducting. Neither of these tests should ever be part of just a screen. They should always be part of a patient coming in with symptoms. So we're gonna move on now, and we're gonna be testing with the 128 hertz tuning fork here. So this tuning fork is lower frequency, and we will hear that as soon as we hit it, okay? I think we heard the ting associated with metal on metal, but trust me, it, it does sound lower. Um, and so with this tuning fork, this is ideal for use for vibration testing, okay? So that's what's transmitted through the dorsal columns along with proprioception. This is particularly useful, especially a common example is diabetic neuropathy. And in fact, for most defects that affect the dorsal columns, that affect both proprioception and vibration, vibration actually tends to be a bit better of a test. That's it if you don't have this tuning fork on you. Uh, you can certainly do proprioception as a surrogate. But generally, vibration works best. Now, the way you do it is, I'm going to take your hand. Ideally, you would actually start on the feet, but for sake of this demonstration, we're just gonna do the upper body. For most neuropathies, and that's generally what will be the common thing that will affect the transmission of vibration uh, sense, it'll start most distally, and as the neuropathy progresses, it'll move proximally, okay? So what you wanna do is test distally, and if it's intact, you're pretty much done. Whereas if there's any problems, you keep moving proximately until you find the area that they can feel. As a general rule, when people have the classic glove and stocking distribution, it's usually the numbness or the paresthesias or the decreased sensation has to reach, I believe it's about the knees, before you'll start to get any problems with the hands. That to, has to do with fiber length, okay? So again, what we're going to demonstrate on the fingers is the same thing that you would do over the toes in a diabetic foot setting, okay? Now, the first thing you should always do with vibration testing is make sure that the patient can actually feel the vibration on a very proximal surface. So again, hitting it. Can you feel the vibration? Yes. Okay, so remember what that feels like. The reason why that's important is sometimes people can just feel it pushing their chest without realizing it's vibrating. But now that he knows what vibration feels like, we can now test a different part of the body, okay? So, what we're gonna do, again, is hit it. Please lift your hand up, and I'm gonna put this on here. So there's a variety of ways you can actually hold this. One of the ways I find works is stabilizing both the hand and the tuning fork, allowing this hand to be free. And the reason is, is I can then say, please close your eyes and tell me when you feel it stop. Stop. Okay? And that allows you to do that. It does take a bit of practice to hold it this way with one hand, Okay, um, but you should practice that because then it allows you to have this hand free. Uh, a few other ways that you can do it is you can sort of hold it like this, you know, with two hands and then slowly put your hand up like that to hold it. That's also acceptable, just as long as you have something. Some people will test the vibration by waiting and seeing how long it takes for them to stop. I don't find that's as useful because I can't reproducibly hit the tuning fork the same every single time. So it could vibrate for different lengths of time. So what I find tends to work better, again, please give me your hand, support that on there, is just doing that, close your eyes please, and tell me when it stops. Now. Okay, and you can see that his sensation was quite good. You would repeat that a few times just to make sure it was quite accurate. Occasionally you'll have patients where it's vibrating, you stop it, they still don't say it stopped, which raises the question of whether they actually felt it in the first place. The other thing that can happen is if it's quite extreme, if I can actually feel the vibration through his finger on the bottom, 
when he tells me it stops, so I know it's clearly vibrating, that would be abnormal as well. But that's uh, a way that you can use the 128 hertz tuning fork. Okay. So we're now going to move on to the last thing, which is monofilament testing. And we're actually going to switch patients at this stage. And I'm just going to show you two monofilaments. They're essentially the same. This is sort of a very simple monofilament that can come in sort of a case like this, since you may see something like that, and it's just kept in there. Um, and this is a little bit fancier in the sense that it looks like a pen, but what actually it is, is the monofilament is hidden there, and so it's protected in that way. And so that can just sit in a lab coat or whatever it might be. Again, there's nothing necessarily better or worse than it. As with all tools, the best tool is the one that you have on you. Okay? So we'll be using this one just for sake of demonstration. So one of the key things about the monofilament is you actually should let it rest between patients. I know that sounds odd, but they're actually fairly well calibrated so that it takes a specific amount of force to actually bend it. Okay? Um, so you shouldn't be using it patient after patient after patient, and usually you're not, because you're not usually seeing a bunch of people uh, for a diabetic foot exam, and if you are, you should actually maybe have multiple ones of these. So the way you do it is you, just like with vibration testing, you want to make sure that the patient can feel it, you actually do it on an area that's very proximal first. So we're going to again head up to the head of the bed, and with our patient, I'm just going to expose your chest a little bit. I want you to close your eyes and tell me that you feel this, okay? Yes. Yes. So he was able to feel it. He knows what it feels like. I want you to remember how that felt because if you even feel it but less strong, weaker, uh, then that would be very important in terms of the scoring with some of the systems we use to judge it. So what I'm going to do now is move down to the feet. And what we will generally do is, uh, depending on older newer guidelines, older guidelines used to talk about nine areas on the foot, on the, uh, this aspect of the foot, the plantar aspect, and usually one area on the dorsum. The previous nine areas were often three toes, and sorry, please say yes every time you hear, uh, feel me touch, and let me know if it feels the same as your sternum or if it's reduced. Okay, and that's interesting. I intentionally did that because he actually has a callus right here. And that's one of the key points is you should not do it right over a callus. Yes, same. Yes, same. Yes, same. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, and again, you have to be very careful. If people have a huge callus on their heel, that will decrease sensation. You should not be testing that. Now, Old Canadian guidelines used to say to do nine here, but the newer ones have actually changed. So what we're now going to do is I'm actually going to test on the uh, dorsal aspect of the foot. And so what some of the newer uh, Canadian guidelines suggest is actually just testing on the distal phalanx of the great toe or the big toe and just testing in this one area can you feel that? Yes. Okay, and does it feel the same as above? Yes. Okay. Uh, so what you then can do, I'm actually going to do both feet. If you could just put your feet together a little bit more, okay? And I'm going to go back and forth, changing the rhythm, and you tell me when you feel it, if it feels normal or reduced, okay? And all of them felt normal? Yes. So one of the newer scoring systems is to do that four times asynchronously, sort of arrhythmically on each toe. And out of that eight times, you add it up. And he scored eight out of eight, completely normal. If the score is less than five, and you actually give a half point if they can feel it, but it's reduced. But if it's less than five, I believe it's three and a half to five, that starts to increase the concern. That's going to predict some problems with uh, the diabetic feet soon, and if it's less than, I believe, three, that's a really concerning score, and that uh, suggests poor prognosis in terms of possible ulceration or other abnormalities uh, imminently. So that's how you use the monofilament. One of the things that I want to emphasize is you 
the actual guidelines may change in terms of where you test, how many times you test, but the key principles are always test on the sternum to make sure they know what they're feeling, then test the area, and do make sure that the monofilament does bend that little bit. You have to be careful. You don't want to overbend it, or else you can actually lose its ability to test properly, but it has to bend a little bit. Like, if just a tiny bit is not enough, it really needs to bend, okay? So that again just takes a lot of practice and just knowing where to test. And that ends the testing for the monofilament. So I wanted to end this talk about equipments with a little bit of a talk on sort of infection control issues. It's quite commonly taught now in medicine that before we see patients we should wash our hands. And what we do in our hospital as sort of best practice is washing our hands when we enter the room, washing our hands before uh, we touch the patient, especially bodily fluids, um, and washing your hands after any such contact and then when we leave the room. So it can be up to four times you may wash your hands. But one of the things that we often don't remember to do is to wash the tools that we carry. So if we have a look at the tools over here, one of the key things you'll need to be careful about when you own your stethoscope is read the instructions very carefully as to what's appropriate material to clean your stethoscope. Okay, usually soap and water is totally fine for these stethoscopes. These ones, the kind of uh, plastic they use, can generally stand up to the cavi wipes, sort of the stronger wipes that can wipe them down. But just be careful and read the instructions very carefully. What I tend to do in the hospital after every patient is I have just one of these alcohol swabs that I keep a bunch of them in my pocket and then I clean the head of the stethoscope after every patient. Not something people commonly do, but I think it's something we should get in the habit of. I'll be honest, I don't actually do that as much with my uh, reflex hammer or the tuning forks, but it's probably something that should be cleaned somewhat regularly. And also again with the monofilament, just very carefully cleaning the tip of it after patients and just letting it air out. Just something to think about, especially be uh, quite diligent about it when you're seeing a patient that you know has some sort of transmittable uh, disease. And that ends this session on sort of the equipments of medicine.